Welcome to The Focus Sessions, Africa's online safety TV show, broadcasting once per month on this frequency. Aviasist has been leading, building and supporting safety promotion in African aviation since 1995. And with The Focus Sessions, we provide you insights into the exciting world of safety and its professionals. And as you know by now, we make watching The Focus Sessions even more interesting for you, by giving you a chance to win 100 US dollars in cash in each episode. And we do this for two reasons. First, it gives you an insight into what inspires my guests here at the table. And the second reason is simpler, of course, it gives you a chance to win those 100 US dollars. You'll see a web address at the bottom of the screen. At that page, you can submit the three letters that I'll give you throughout the broadcast and that, together, form a three-letter code. Every 10 minutes or so, uh, we'll show you one of the favorite books of a guest here at the table. And all you have to do is write down the first letter of the first name of the author. And you'll end up with a three-letter code. From among the correct answers, we'll draw one lucky winner and send that person her or his 100 US dollars by mobile money. And we'll announce the winner uh, on our LinkedIn page. So that's a good reason to follow Aviasist on LinkedIn. Now, over to the topic of today, investigation for safety. Investigation uh, of accidents, incidents and occurrences is crucial to realize an organization or, or a company that is learning from its mishaps. An organization that is not primarily interested in looking for a guilty person or persons for the who question, but an organization that is interested in answering the why question. But then it's important that a strong investigation capability is created in that airline, that airport, the air navigation service provider, or an independent body. Today we'll be talking about what represents best practice in terms of investigation. I'm joined here at the table by Jan Smeitink, Annemarie Schuiter, and my partner in safety promotion, Chamzu Anjurin. Jan, let me start with you. You worked as a flight engineer for over 20 years with KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines, one of the founding fathers of the Avia Assist Foundation, actually. And your long and illustrious career included a position uh, of chairman of um, the Aviation Chamber of the Dutch Safety Board, um, chairman of the runway safety team at Amsterdam Airport. But your most recent and very exciting role was supporting the government of Rwanda, hence my little bow tie here, uh, in strengthening its Aviation Accident Investigation Division. Uh, you're now back in the Netherlands. Um, do you miss the sun? Uh, we have beautiful sunny weather right now, <laughs> <laughs> but it sure is a changeover. Yeah, yeah. But I enjoy being back on, on, on the Netherlands. Back actually. on your yeah. soil of birth, basically, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, great to have you in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Um, Anne-Marie, that uh, brings me to you. Uh, we have uh, one thing in common in that we both graduated from uh, Leiden University here in the Netherlands and equally we both studied at what I think is a brilliant institute, the International Institute of Air and Space Law uh, at Leiden University. Um, your career included uh, six years with the Ministry of Health, so a different yes. uh, department, from where you joined the Dutch Safety Board as their, their legal counsel. Uh, you provide in-company training on the legal framework of accident investigation and investigation. But you're also now a guest lecturer at the same International Institute of Air and Space Law in Leiden. Yeah. I would imagine that must be like a great feeling, you know, to first be there as a student and to give back to those students in the university. Yeah, it's absolutely marvelous to be able to do that and to interact with really young students from all over the world. and try to um, explain to them what the legal framework is of accident investigation and also to tell them a little bit about my experiences with the MH17 investigation. And yeah, I really love doing that. Yes. Okay. And the other thing you love, I noticed on your CV, is dancing. Yes. And you yes. told me you were dancing even last night. Yes, yes. I had a ballet class. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Just ballet. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. I've been doing that since the age of three. So, uh -huh. yeah. Well, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, um, great to hear some insights into people's personal lives yes. as well. And thank you for being here and joining us today at the table. Welcome. You're welcome. And that brings me um, to you, Chamsu. I mean, um, 
by now, again, a lot of our viewers will know you because you, um, you quite often sit here and, and help me with these uh, safety promotion sessions. But we may also have some new viewers, um, so I think it's good to know that, you know, you always say that your career is basically divided in two parts. Uh, the first 20 years or so qualified as an aviation engineer and you joined the Pan-African airline uh, Air Afrique, which existed then. And then you changed to aircraft manufacturer uh, Boeing, uh, where you were the director of safety for the whole of Africa, but also uh, carried roles in, in sales and uh, commercial. Uh, part of, of the Boeing uh, enterprise, a huge enterprise. Now, next to a lot of uh, pro bono work, if you like, that you do for us and for the Aviation Safety Alliance uh, for Africa, you're also the coordinator of the African Aviation Industry Group. What is that uh, group about, briefly? Uh, this group is, what is about uh, bringing together uh, all stakeholders of aviation, the airlines through the association, airports, and navigation service provider, and service providers like OEMs. OEMs to, being original? Uh, original uh, equipment manufacturers like Boeing, Airbus, okay. uh, ATM, to uh, focus on how to improve and, and develop aviation in a whole, not only safety, but mm -hmm. aviation in Africa, knowing that it is uh, the only way to integrate uh, people and speed up the economic development of the continent. Because what people outside Africa who've never been to Africa often forget is that it is a huge continent. I mean, yes. on the map, we always see it depicted much smaller than it actually is. Yes. So with the, with the industry group, you try to promote air transport, not just on safety, but make sure that yes. the facilities are there, etc. Yeah, uh, trying to bring uh, out what are the addressing the common challenges of all these industry players to to make sure that we we, we, we grow the market together. Well, great to have you the, at the table here again in the studio in the, the broadcasting capital of the Netherlands, Hilversum. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we'll be looking at three dimensions um, of safety investigations. Our first topic is to look into the moral, legal and financial arguments for investigations. Why would we want to investigate or perhaps sometimes why do we have to investigate? Our second topic is how to address the lack of um, investigation expertise, because that is a big challenge um, in the African region where Aviasist works. And our third topic, uh, we will be looking at the importance of publicating and pub publicizing, you know, the outcomes of investigations, the lack of transparency sometimes uh, uh, going on and, and maybe not even transparency, but understanding that it's important if the rest of Africa and the world wants to learn from incidents and accidents happening, we have to find a way to make it public and share it, basically. Um, Anne-Marie, um, with your teaching on Annex 13, I, might, I don't want to go into a real long legal discussion about definitions, of course, but what is the, the main focus of Annex 13 to the Chicago Convention that deals with investigation? Well, I think the main focus is that it's, it's about accident investigation uh, primarily and, and serious incidents um, to try to see what has happened, learn from it, try to prevent similar accidents uh, uh, happening in the future. Um, and um, it has uh, some... Um, main topics, the legal framework. One is, well, definitely uh, that it's not to apportion blame or liability. The investigation has to be set apart from any judicial proceedings whatsoever. Um, it, investigation needs to be done uh, as independent as possible. Um, you need to keep the uh, information that you are gathering, like statements and um, uh, out, um, read outs of, of um, recordings and so on as confidential as possible uh, to make sure that you are able to get that information um, uh, as, as much as possible to, to see eventually what happened and get the facts clear and try to learn from it. That's, that's the main basis, I think. Why it happened, basically. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, of course, the Annex 13 people can, can look it up online. Actually, you can probably find it and, and read it in more detail. But I think what's also important, if I can take it to you, Jan, on the one hand, you have the 
formal investigations in case of an accident. But uh, when you were with KLM after your flight engineering years, you were also involved in internal investigations. Do you see similar basic principles apply there as, uh, that come from Annex 13? Absolutely, that should be the case in any way. Uh, in, um, uh, with, uh, with KLM that was very professional and they followed the lines of Annex 13 uh, completely. So also the no blame uh, philosophy, not to apportion blame or liability, was very strongly embedded also in the structure of KLM and the agreement that they made with the pilot union also strongly underlined that same principle. So ideally an airline should follow the same rules. Uh, there is no basic difference between an incident or a serious incident. Uh, of apart course, from the consequences, but apart I mean, from yeah, the consequences, and apart, of course, from uh, and of course, the capacity of an investigation board of a country cannot investigate every tiny little incident, no. but every incident might bear inherent safety lessons that that might be very important, especially when those incidents you have more of the same kind. Uh, many small bird strikes are an indication that sooner or later a very heavy bird strike might occur that is a serious incident or an accident. So learn from those smaller events? Yeah, people argue sometimes about the Heinz uh, pyramid, but <laughs> the little ones add up. Uh, and if you don't keep the base of the pyramid small, limited, then sooner or later with, with the, the high small risk. incidents being at the bottom of the pyramid, yes, basically. Yes, and yes, yes. And then sooner or later you might expect the very serious incident or even an accident happening. So. And, and of course I refer to you in terms of uh, that you were um, with KLM as an airline investigating those things, but Chamzu, I mean, in your uh, 20 years have you also seen uh, the eagerness, hopefully increasing eagerness with airports and air navigation service providers in Africa but also across the globe to to try and learn from smaller things? Learn from smaller things is not uh, natural because people tend to focus, oh, it's not important. Oh, uh, so, yeah, it's hap it happens, but it's minor. It's minor. Uh, and this is, uh, we, we have to, to insist of learning from any opportunity, even from what works well. Yeah. And, and we yeah. don't we don't focus on that because it, it, it's no. it is normal that the flight went well. Uh, yes, but uh, during that same flight that went well, there are many things that happened that were saved by the system, the the, the, the pilots, the crew, the, the, the crew, and we didn't we don't learn about it because we don't focus on that. No, no. Uh, and this is an opportunity, a missed opportunity. So we, it's a, it's a, it's, it has to be a conscious effort to learn from any situation, good or bad. And I think that's also nice because what you're referring to, I think, is quite often nowadays termed safety 2.0, where we say we don't just learn from things that go wrong, but what can we learn from things that yeah. actually go well? Yeah. And again, like I think, as Jan said, if you investigate those smaller incidents, you can also pick some of those things up. Yes. Every incident is an opportunity to learn. I go yeah. along with that uh, very much, uh, uh, Shamsu. And if you have these advanced uh, safety management um, uh, applications that you have these days, and you count uh, the number of uh, rushed approaches, then you, you might prevent uh, a, a runway excursion yeah. because you uh, can define your safety policy on preventing those rushed approaches or um, not making a go around after a uh, ground prox warning uh, is sounding, um, a crew's uh, thinking, oh, I can still make it. If that number is increasing, then of course you can wait for a serious incident Almost, to happen. Yeah. So, so it, it, it is uh, th those little incidents and investigation of those incidents and putting them in a comprehensive database um, is uh, is preventing is, is using them as precursors for the for the serious ones and preventing them to happen. I'd like to come back to to you in a moment about this uh, the database you talk about and how complex or simple it should be. But first, it's time for our viewers out there uh, for your chance to win one hundred US dollars. Um, <laughs> this book is a, is a French book which Chamzu yeah. uh, took out. It's called La Vie Secrète des Arbres. The Secret Life of Trees. Yes. And what is important for you out there is the author of the book. And it's a bit difficult to see at the moment, but it's Peter Wolleben. Peter Wolleben. So it's the P, the Papa, that you need to fill in as the first letter code um, on the Google form that you see 
uh, in front of you. Um, why the secret life of trees? What, what does this book mean to you, uh, Chamsu? Well, we, 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 we see trees, we, see, we like uh, uh, the environment, and we don't imagine that it, a lot, it, a, a vast a world exists there where trees have a community, they communicate among themselves, and it impacts on our life, but we don't know it. So it's, it has also something to do with what we are talking about, because uh, there are things happening around us, there are signals there that we don't pay attention to, uh, and until something happens. Sometimes you can, you can also... Have that with a tree. That yeah. With yeah. the trees, yes. And when you say communicate, you mean the substreams between roots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I For also instance, didn't know about the, that until a few the years The trees ago. protect themselves against common trust. And then, uh, they, 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 if you take acacia, for instance, they, have, uh, hap they happen to grow the, the, the stings to protect themselves against the uh, giraffe who, who eat the, wants to eat the, wants to eat <laughs> the, the bark fruits, or the, the fruit the, okay. or the leaves. So this, the, so this, they, they develop this, uh, they produce this uh, sting to prevent them those to, that to happen. So <laughs> some some variety of acacia. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll put it. Uh, yeah. My French is a bit rusty, <laughs> but I'll try and have a go at it. Yeah. Well, now that I'm with you, actually, Chamzu, um, um, I mentioned in the beginning that we'll also speak about the lack of expertise. You know, when, when you're um, when you work as a safety officer in a small operator in Africa, you may not have many resources available. If you look. Back at the last 20 years of your career in particular, um, you know, with, with Boeing, aircraft manufacturer Boeing, does an aircraft manufacturer um, provide support to help its customers with not just accident investigation, but also incident investigation? Oh, yes, because first of all, it's a common interest. The more we know about what's happening, the better it's for the industry. And so it's, it's, uh, there's a conscious effort to train our, our customers to learn from the incidents, and uh, even there are even some systems that are developed to to capture to capture those uh, incidents almost automatically. So through a data collection system, and today uh, an aircraft is mostly uh, computer flying. You know, there's a lot of gener data is generated, and we don't even learn from 10 percent of that capability. So it's a lot, so, so there's still a lot to do there to, to capture this data, to uh, analyze them and share the, the, the knowledge out of it. Because so. that's what some viewers, especially uh, young graduates who've just graduated, may not always know you think of data in the black box, you know, yeah. but, but of course we also learn a lot from data that is captured in the quick access recorder, as yes. you call it, and that actually relates to the point you made earlier that we learn from regular flights where nothing goes wrong but where there are still yeah. safety points or perhaps efficiency points sometimes uh, exactly. to pick up. How do you see that? Yeah. Uh, because you're involved not just in, in aviation but in accident investigation as well. The cooperation with the, with the manufacturers, is that something you see often or always? Yes, yes, because we highly depend on them for uh, specific technical information. We don't have the knowledge of all aircraft out there, of all manufacturing uh, details. So uh, yes, if, if we have an investigation going on or if we participate in one, we really need the involvement of the manufacturer. Yes, absolutely. It's crucial. If, if Jan, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I can think of several examples during my time at KLM incident investigation. There's not serious incidents, not, not at the safety board level, uh, whereby Boeing supplied excellent support in, in finding the culprit. In one occasion, even building a test rig to test a specific technical solution for the in, for the cause of uh, for for the technical mishap that had caused the incident that has even been applied worldwide on all 767s at the time so a normal incident investigation with the help of uh, Boeing came out to a uh, uh, had a very significant positive result for the whole world. And of course, other brands are available. Eh? It's not just Boeing. No, <laughs> <does> no. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, in Rwanda, we even had contact with Airbus and, and yeah. that was on a smaller scale. But yeah. um, uh, in generally, generally, I think uh, uh, the manufacturers are very open uh, and very willing because it's also their product, it's their, their product, reputation, their, their future. Uh, so. 
But but you mentioned, of course, KLM. Um, is there, because the last three years you've spent in Rwanda, <laughs> build, building up together with Charles Bagabo, who was yeah. heading up the division, you know, building up that expertise. I can imagine, you know, if, if for example, KLM, uh, you know, 150 plus aircraft contacts a manufacturer, of course they will listen. But would that be different, you think, if you're from a country where there's a small operator where they think, well, this is just Togo or Benin, what do they... That is not according to my experience. Okay, we had some well, depressurization problems, some persistent depressurization problems on an aircraft, and, and we had very good contact both with the local Boeing representative okay. and with Boeing at, uh, at Seattle itself. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. It's uh, equally important to learn to deal with a small operator uh, who has a problem uh, or is, is facing an, an incident or a larger uh, operator. The only difference might be that uh, you have more opportunities to deal with a larger uh, operator because of the numbers. Uh, so there's more the, interaction. The yeah. inter but the quality of the relationship is about the same. So, so when, we, when we speak about this lack of expertise or the, the need to build the expertise, investigation expertise, the call or the, the call basically always to Africa would also be, don't forget that you have this resource in terms exactly, of manufacturing. Tom, yes. I was about to mention that. Uh, 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 you have limited resources in most African countries. You have a limited amount of investigators. Do not forget the participation of the, the, of the aircraft manufacturer. They are very willing to help you. And again, like you said, not just for major accidents that make no, the headlines, no. but also for... Uh, no. For smaller uh, issues, okay. I think it's time for um, our second book. Actually, this, this really relates to um, the topic of accident investigation. And I don't know if you've read it, but it's certainly worthwhile to read. It's a book called Personal Effects uh, by Robert Jensen. He was a guest uh, in the focus sessions here um, last season. Um, it's a fantastic read, but also full of lessons for... Um, for people in the industry to learn from. It's basically how to, you know, it's about dealing with the personal effects of, of people that perish mm. in an aircraft crash. But he also gives fantastic insights into, um, into how the, those processes work. So it's not just about the, um, the personal effects, but yeah, about the, what recovering the dead teaches me about caring for the living. So this is the second letter, the R from Robert, or Romeo in aviation, uh, for your, your form out there to win the 100 US dollars. Um, now, Jan, one of the things you were also involved in uh, at KLM, I think, is after your, or maybe during your flight engineering years, is uh, the start of a, an in-company magazine oh, uh, yeah. to, to share those lessons, because that's one of the things I also want to take all of you to a little bit. You know, it's, imagine we have this fantastic situation where we now have some investigative capabilities in my former home country, Zambia, or, in, or um, in Togo. But what to do then with that information? So what, what happened in KLM? What did you do with that magazine in those days? Well, a, a long time ago, I was quite impressed by the magazine that British Airways had, and, uh, and then ultimately we started up our own. And it was a bit of a battle, but uh, the transparency issue that we probably will, uh, will, will cross uh, later on plays a great role in that. Why was it the battle? Hmm? Why was it a battle? Uh, initially, there was some reluctance to openly publish everything, every little incident that happened within the fleet. Every blown tire, every rejected takeoff, uh, um, uh, every go around that did not go quite well was, was mentioned in there. Uh, so people needed to get used of openly having that openly published. There was also a PR board or something with KLM who initially tried to put the thing off. But I got strong backup from, from uh, the COO at the time Chief. to do it, the Chief operate, Operating Officer. Uh, and maybe it, it's a good illustration. We had a, a, a column in there or, or a, a, a regular feature, basically. Regular, regular yeah. feature. I was looking for the word. Thank you, <laughs> feature. Share your experience. In the beginning, we got few stories. People did not want to tell their mistakes, yeah. which are not really mistakes. But then they started to come. They started to come after they saw how valuable the magazine was, what lessons were there. 
I had a I had a captain who was saying to me, if I read your magazine, it helps me to prevent mishaps in my own Operation. career, in my own f flying days. And then the stories came about a wrong altimeter setting in Russia, where they use an an another altimeter setting and flying 600 uh, feet or 600 meters, I, I don't recall, too low. Yeah. Uh, things like that, or, or, or confusing with an exit on a complicated airport. And, and then we had so many stories that we said, <laughs> uh, th these are very relevant for this time of the year, for example, something about bird strikes in the autumn. Do you mind if we keep it for the next one? We because we have too story. many stories. Yeah. So it became a big success. But you were saying uh, a magazine, does it mean everybody had access to it? Was it for sale in the shops or how did no, that No, 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 no. And uh, just to uh, come up with the, <laughs> with the, with the uh, doubts about uh, if it's possible to be transparent on everything, we addressed the uh, magazines to everyone personally with a sticker. In the number, company? In the yeah. company, within the company. We had... Um, uh, um, yeah, but it was eventually also sent to all pursers, so we wanted yeah. to include the cabin, cabin crew, crew as well. Um, many, many things are rejected, takeoff and emergency evacuation things, of course, it, it's very much cabin and Linked. cockpit yeah. related, yeah. Uh, interlinked. <clears throat> we sent it also out to many external parties and we did a very regular survey if these addresses were still correct and if they still wanted to have the magazine. There was some disclaimer in it, but basically, if 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 a reporter would uh, would like to get hold of the magazine, they could, they could. But there was a little threshold about it. Okay. Um, and when I saw a magazine in the crew center on on the floor or on the table addressed to us, then I always took care that this guy or this girl got a message. This is this you is picked not, it up, and please be a bit more. This careful. is not the way to deal with this okay. relatively confidential information. And on one occasion there was, uh, maybe I should tell that as well, there was, um, yeah, there was some misbehavior during training flying, a low pass was made just out of joy with an empty yeah. aircraft in Chateauroux. And um, then there was some strong pressure not to publish that one, it, it became an official investigation. But then I said, no, 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 we have this, this protocol here and saying all official uh, safety investigations that we do that had a special name, an abbreviated version is going to be published in the magazine. So if you don't publish, I'm no longer the, the editor-in-chief, then I withdraw. Oh, okay, so and you I made a very withdraw. strong statement then that... And uh, then I immediately got support again, so a top-down commitment, we, that is also very important for Africa, top-down commitment is extremely important. I got immediately back up again from that CEO who said, no, nope, you're right, we must face the, the mistake that we have made here. We must be open about it. Yeah, so that's an important point as well, to make sure if you go down that route, and of course nowadays we have the benefit of being able to do it digitally, which is cheaper, but also yeah. means it's perhaps easier to make sure only the person you want to get gets it. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, in terms of digital information and, and, and sharing lessons digitally, um, Anne-Marie, if I can take that to you, is, is that something you as an investigation board do? Can people yes, read? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so we actually have an obligation to publish every report that we issue. Um, and as you said, nowadays it's much easier. You can, uh, can find it online on our uh, website. If it's um, a major investigation, and usually we also have like um, some uh, digital footage, like um, uh, photos or a short video about the accident investigation. Uh, and also, we have our uh, quarterly reports with the less serious incidents in okay. it. Um, and also that is uh, to be found on our website. So it's www. <laughs> we'll I think put it, it's we'll Dutch safetyboard.nl. Uh, yeah. I think I'm not sure. I know the, uh, the Dutch name, but that's too complicated. Yeah. Onderzoeksraad. Um, so yeah, it's, e it's it easy, uh, accessible. Yes, absolutely. Because we want to spread um, all the lessons that we uh, were able to draw. So, and, and I think in that respect, I should pass a compliment. There are a number of uh, accident investigation branches now in Africa who are carefully starting to publish. I mean, Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda was also carefully entering that stage where people can just find reports online and actually in the new newsletter which we've started as Avia Assist, we point people to those websites because sometimes they're a little bit hidden still, you have to okay. do a bit more work and it's our interest as Avia Assist to make sure people can read them of course. Um, and um, let me first get to the next book before I forget the last book for today, again 
for your three-letter code. Um, Alexander McCall Smith, the Miracle Motors, but the important thing is the first letter of the first name, the Alpha for Alexander. Uh, Jan, you took this book. Yeah, yeah. In a the Miracle, Miracle Motors. It is about an. Uh, it is about the number one ladies' detective agency, and it, yeah. uh, this is one of the of the volumes of a whole a, a series, array, a whole series of books, and it's about. Um, uh, it, uh, the, the setting is Botswana. Okay. It's uh, written in a very charmingly way. It uh, explains the problems that the African continent has or has inherited due to its colonial past. It is about discrimination, man-wife relationship. Um, but just the problems or also opportunities? Opportunities, uh, definitely. It is about life in Africa, uh, about uh, religion, but all written in a very nice way. And it also uh, states, uh, it, it also goes, it is about the resilience of the people, the cheerfulness of the people, the, the ever reviving energy that Africa displays. And that it's, it's a, it really touches it's a good your heart. Read. And the individual stories, many also, of them are, so, uh, they always have a nice unexpected twist. So it's very entertaining to, not heavy stuff, yeah. but very entertaining to read, um, especially when you... Interesting or about enough. to sleep and, and, and you like, uh, you like uh, to read a little bit and, and to, to fall asleep in, in, with, with, a, with peace of mind. And I think if I connect that point where you say, you know, it, it speaks about the, the, the joy and, and that you find a lot in Africa, which I think we can learn a lot of, you know, here in, in the West. And actually it would mean you'd be perfectly at home there because, you know, the amount of dancing that happens in Africa. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's true. If you look at the Avia Sis courses, you know, in Africa, we dance in the courses. Really? If you, if you oh, would try, if you would try that go. here. I should go. <laughs> if you try that here, you know, if you say, all right, we're going to put them some music oh, and have no, a dance, it'll be like, oh, no, I don't dance. Here. <laughs> Etc. Yeah. Thinkable. Yeah. Um, I want to move briefly to the topic of, um, you know, uh, how we want to try or suggestions we have for the viewers, how to build that lack of expertise. Now I have to do a little bit of a plug here. The Aviasis Foundation does organize an incident investigation course because people all see those beautiful documentaries on um, um, Discovery Channel, you know, about accident investigation, but also in Africa, the reality of life, which is fantastic of course, is that it's incidents we have to investigate. Uh, Jan, you're our instructor on this uh, course. I think we'll do another course um, next year. Um, so know that as a resource as well, but Chamsu, any suggestions, any ideas how you think we can address that lack of expertise in Africa in terms of investigation? Yeah, the lack of expertise uh, uh, relies on uh, the fact that there are not that many accidents, although there are enough incidents that could keep people going, but as we said earlier, people focus on big things yeah, yeah. and there's not there's not a lot of that happening that uh, requires to man that uh, help to maintain those skills the, once the, you build them the required skills so one way to go is to uh, pull the resources together this has been uh, a, a, a drive in within africa you have uh, regional organizations that have been formed. Uh, in West Africa, you have the Bagaya, which is the Banjul Lako Group Accident uh, Investigation Agency, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, cover about seven countries. So they pull the resources. Pull the resource yeah. together to... The challenge is to have those seven countries contribute to the functioning of yeah. this, um, this organization. Both in terms of human resource, but also yes. financial resources, yes. of course. Okay. Yes. But so pooling this. So if uh, that, uh, that is addressed, I think the best to, it's a good way of uh, covering the required investigations for those seven countries. And we can even go further, imagine a, an agency for Africa. But unfortunately, Africa being so big, it will create new problems because you want uh, to pull resources, but you also want to have uh, to be close to the events. Yeah, uh, and not geographic, because we've <laughs> yeah. said already it's a, it's yes. a huge continent. It's a huge continent. Now, you mentioned the skills of people. That brings me to a question, actually, which we got from Africa, uh, from Sahiru, uh, actually from West Africa. And, and the question to all of you, I'll start with, with Anna-Marie, if I may, for example. Um, 
because the question of Sahiru is, what do you think are the qualities that somebody in an investigation of body, whether it is accidents or internally, what are the qualities those people would need? What would be your mm -hmm. response to Sahiru? Oh, that, that's a difficult one. I think, you, yeah, you really need to be skilled in whatever you are investigating. Um, if you are like the, the IIC, so the investigator in charge, you need to have an overview. You need to know uh, what would be the best um, team members uh, to pull that, uh, that kind of effort. Um, yeah. But if you bring it more back, perhaps even to basic skills in terms of inter interpersonal skills or... What, what, what? I don't know. I think Jan is, is the one. Well, may, maybe I can. Uh, I don't want to cut you short. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't. Well, we're complimenting no, each other. You're not. You're uh, not. I saw she um, made, a, which yeah. is still very valid. They made Asasi a, is what is Asasi? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's the International Society of Air Safety Investigators. Okay. So, so yeah. it, is, it is a global organization and practically every country who has a bit of a safety board or an investigation board is a member, a member of, of the ISASI. Okay. Yeah. I took care that Rwanda uh, became member of ISASI as well immediately because it's, uh, it's a little bit of a side path here, but uh, it's a small country with limited expertise. So when they can connect to the world, that yeah. would be very beneficial they can them. So then is get resources through that channel yes, as well. Yes, that yeah. is a little bit money very wisely and well spent. spent. So ISOSI has published, coming back to the issue, uh, a code of conduct um, okay. which this interpersonal skills, like you were mentioning, like integrity, um, uh, do not uh, focus in, into, uh, have a broad view, uh, no tunnel vision, uh, 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 not to blame, apportion blame and liability, all those, all those elements that y you need to have a certain uh, character for it. Okay. If you are a big businessman wanting to make big deals, <laughs> that, then you should not be in this business. If you are a little bit of a perfect, perfectionist, perfectionist, you, you yeah. want to, to do things really well, um, there's a little bit of idealism in there. Um, well, so I think a lot. <laughs> I think a lot. <laughs> yes. A lot of ideas. So it is, yes. it is, and that's, that's it, we it's a world. We want to make the world safer, yeah. right? Yeah. That's our main goal. Yeah. Yeah. One way or the other. So it shouldn't be a job, it should be a passion almost in a way. Or a I, yeah. think yeah. So. Yeah. I think so. When the I look real, at my colleagues. Yeah. The real good investigators, they, they really, and they seldomly quit the job. I mean, they do okay. that for a lifetime. And, and I think you're getting better and better and better at it. Because we're talking about expertise and lack of expertise and lack of training in Africa. But the more investigations you do, yeah. albeit little investigations, you more, you understand uh, how it's really going on, what you need to do. Um, I think also if you are part of the network like ISASI, there are some other ones uh, as well um, around the globe, it's so easy um, to just pick up the phone and ask somebody with more experience for some advice. I mean, it's not always necessary to come over or, or mm, to really no. actually participate, but just have the, the means to contact somebody that you know personally and, and, and explain whatever you are facing and, and having their professional advice. And you know them personally because you would have mean, been to an ISASI mean meeting. To a or seminar a, or a conference yeah. Of course that helps. Personal contacts helps, help really. enormously, but generally it is a, is a, is a, is a very... Um, so, uh, the bunch of investigators, global bunch of investigators, it's, it's a very support, supporting yeah, type absolutely. of people, v very yeah. much so. And you can, of course, um, make, it, uh, make it formal by having an MOU with, uh, with a country. With another investigative uh, body. Like Rwanda has done with Singapore. An MOU as in an agreement to work and together, an agreement basically. That, and, then, of course, uh, Singapore is a very professional and that they have uh, reader, uh, uh, voice recording and uh, data recording facilities and everything. So they're far ahead of, of Rwanda, let's be honest about that. But then, of course, the, 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 the memorandum is we help you and, and you, you help us. But same question as before with KLM, big airline, easier than a small airline. Uh, from your experience, for example, in Rwanda, is it easy to, I mean, on the one hand, it's nice to say we're all cooperating, let's all be together. Mm -hmm. But when you are, uh, when you come from uh, your country of birth, for example, you know, in West Africa, and you're a small country, do other people want to cooperate with you? 
Oh, yes. Generally, th yes. Th they want to get it official with a m memorandum. Yeah. It might be a bit more difficult because then they really are committed. And we tried that, for example, with the, 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 the <laughs> it's one of the best in the world, the AARB from, from Britain. And they said, we will help you. Don't worry. If there really is something, we will help you. But we're not going to write it down. Okay. <laughs> we, so, we had the same. We didn't put it in writing, but I'm, I'm sure if it is necessary, we would And the question would out. arise. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I feel honestly that, and that was maybe the topic in, in my ISAC presentation too, that there could be more official reach out to Africa. If we from from the rest of the world, from Africa. from from, from the, the, the highly qualified uh, institutions in the world, um, on on a on a unofficial basis, there is lots of camaraderie. I almost would call it. Yeah. Um, and if you want to get it in a memorandum, then it's becoming a bit more tough. But so you're saying, in a way, also perhaps more proactive actions from those bigger investigation points, saying, hey. You people in, you know, you experts I, I would, in, in Togo. The, 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 the question about expertise, which is an, in, indeed a difficult question, and of course you can borrow the expertise based on the incident at hand, but it would be lovely, of course, if an African investigator with limited experience could participate in in an AAIB investigation as an on-the-job training, uh, like an like an advanced internship, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. and th that they could could do that, and that is very difficult to effectuate. That, that, then people start to become... Did you try it? We, we did try it. Yeah. And why, why do you think it was difficult? Yeah, There's that, visas that, and all these things, of yeah, course. Yeah, there, there were two reasons mentioned in this particular case, and, and I don't, not, want, don't want to disqualify the AARB because they're, they're very high-rated people, very nice people too. But there was some international policy being developed at the time, and that was not yet ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nah, nah, I didn't know what to think about that. <laughs> uh, and then they said, "Yeah, the world is bigger than Rwanda, so so <laughs> if we do it for you, then, then the rest of Africa yeah, might." Then, yeah. So that is a bit of a problem. And, and, and that is a fair point because I remember in the conversations we had before, is, is uh, Anna you said we are already very understaffed because in your case you do health investigations, loads of investigations. Yes. So you can't commit to every. Of the 55 African Unfortunately countries? Unfortunately no. not. I mean, I, I'm sure that if you ask uh, individual investigators, they are absolutely willing to help out wherever they can, but get it formalized and, and really commit in writing to it, that's a whole different ball game. And, and yes, because we are all, already Understaffed, yeah, understaffed. Very busy. Yeah, 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 we have so many investigations going on. Yeah. And I'm sure that's the same, you know, yeah. in, in, in African countries where they have started building their expertise, like Rwanda, like Nigeria, like Kenya, they're also not, there's not tons of people around the table they could, uh, yeah. you know, lend out. And then there is the, the cost aspect, of course, even when you can go to a, to a training abroad or even an internship that takes a longer period, let's say three months at least. Yeah, the, the traveling and, and staying housing, staying housing, somewhere housing, in Europe yeah. for the average African country is uh, is a big expense. Of yeah. Is yeah. a big expense. At the same time, I think also there, and this is a bone of contention I always have. We also have to perhaps call upon African countries sometimes because, of course, you know the the daily allowance is something we often go on about in Africa. They also make it quite difficult from themselves. You know where they say if you go to Montreal for a course, you're entitled to three hundred dollars per day, <laughs> for example. You know, so I think maybe also okay. on the side of yeah, on the yeah. side of, of the African countries, you have to be somewhat modest in that because it should be about the expertise building and not yeah. Yeah. It, the economic driver. I, I'm afraid uh, we're sort of. Uh, coming towards the end of um, today's show, yeah, that's how quick it goes, Jan. I can yeah, see your face. Yeah, I, I, I want to say this. Yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah, I guess if you're having fun, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe I can ask you each one last question. You know, if, if you can give one tip where you think, you know, what, what could Africa do to really help build that expertise of investigation, whether it is large investigations, accidents, or small things. One suggestion that you might have, if I can start, Jan, you have long tradition here. What would you suggest in that respect? Oh, yeah, you get me there. Uh, one, one thing, um, I, I, th I think you, you can do, you, you can train and train and train, but just do those incident investigations. Just get started with it. Even though it may not be perfect, perhaps. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. 
Um, 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 the, the aviasist course, and um, okay, I, mean, I don't want Thank to you for promote the plug, it, but yeah. the aviasist <laughs> course is, is just a tiny little, little. It's a, it, it, it is a low threshold uh, thing. It does not cost money. So if you can grab some basic education and just start and, and try to affiliate with professional people, to, don't do an investigation because I read it somewhere on your own. Mm -hmm. on your own. Make sure. Try to yeah. affiliate with other professionals and just do it because. The, the, the most beautiful safety management incident investigation course from the Flight Academy in Singapore it, or, or Cranfield or the South Californian Inst Institute, it cannot compensate the practical experience by simply doing. And I think sometimes that's also what we see as Avia Sis. I think the expression is the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, sometimes indeed a good example is our course. It is not IKO certified, it's not IATA certified, but it's the only course currently delivered in Africa. Mm. So be pragmatic in that respect. Uh, be pragmatic and, and by doing those uh, incident investigations and, and, and publish them, you also slowly promote the, the transparency, the yeah, willingness yeah. to share lessons, because there's still a lot of, like with the safety magazine we were discussing, it, it has a slow start and suddenly there is the momentum and everyone starts to recognize, oh wow, yeah, they, they're showing, they're making themselves vulnerable by showing all the things that go wrong, but we can learn from it. This is the path that, to go. That's the path And to then go. it starts to spread. Great. So that's, uh, I think, you know, start somewhere. Don't be afraid to start somewhere. Don't wait for it to be perfect indeed. No. Anne-Marie, did you think of one thing where you think oh, that's I'm something trying, I can I'm give trying. the viewers? Uh, um, I think, well, from my personal perspective, I would say make sure that you have some type of legal framework in place that guarantees um, um, that people can talk to you without any um, uh, consequences like... Uh, getting prosecuted or whatever, make sure that you have some type of agreements uh, with your prosecutors or um, other um, uh, uh, like other stakeholders that might be interested in the same occurrence. From a legal to make point sure, of view, yeah. yeah, make sure that people can can talk to you and and that they can uh, um, give you all the information needed and make sure that you can guarantee them some type of confidentiality. Um, as to safeguard um, yeah, the access to uh, crucial information. And I think some of that information, like, like the MOU between, I know in the UK, for example, between yeah. AIIB and the Department yeah. of Public Prosecution is available online. You can even find yeah. that MOU locally. So yes, there are, there are more uh, of those uh, around the example, globe available. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's highly important. Like every time that we actually talk to a person that was involved in an occurrence. That's what they bring up. It, and it's the big, it's where we begin. We say, okay, everything you are telling here is 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 uh, to a certain extent, of course, because we do publish a report. But yeah. we try to keep it away from uh, like like persons actually as much as we yeah. can. Um, look for the it's why. Guaranteed, we are trying to keep it uh, uh, completely confidential. Um, Safeguards okay. are in place. Put safeguards Just in place. Give us the necessary information because otherwise no good result uh, is able to be achieved. achieved. Absolutely true. It's a prerequisite. It comes even before starting in this incident. Yeah. You can only start do that when that has been... Yeah, the legal framework. blame when free reporting. Place. So please tell yeah. whatever mistakes happen and don't yeah. be afraid of any yeah. negative consequences. If we can get that atmosphere in place, we have another focus session about organizational culture and just culture that yeah. earlier in the year touched upon that. Chamsu, your um, one suggestion for the viewers out there, if they want to increase that investigative capability? Yeah, I would say uh, investigate uh, the, even the smallest events. And we have developed, uh, Boeing has developed something called MIDA, which is maintenance events decision analysis Media, yeah. and it's uh, I, and I actually prefer the term analysis than investigation because it's uh, really uh, that can be applied in any airlines or any organization to get to the it, uh, the root cause of maintenance events and uh, it has it, it is very structured it's a structured approach. You can train your people uh, for that, and they can analyze all events that happen. And, and because it is not focused on the people, but on the 
the process, events, event, the process, yeah. you should sometimes di discover that the, the problem is the organization. Mm -hmm. And not and, the end. Uh, Quite often, actually. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. and most of the time, and actually uh, almost 90% of uh, events are related to the organization. Yeah. And then you need the courage to face it and say, okay, let's address this thing. And actually thank the, we should almost thank the, the people who are involved in those events for allowing this, to learn, the, from. to learn from this situation. Instead of blaming them, mm -hmm. we should actually reward them to allow the organization to know about it. Okay, so the three points I pick up from, from these individual suggestions you have, first of all, make sure you have a legal framework in place to protect the people that you want to get the information for. Jan was saying, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, you know, accept that in the beginning your learning curve is gonna be really steep. And I think in your case, you're saying start somewhere, even with the smallest incident. And again, like you mentioned, of course, your background as an engineer, also look at things like maintenance incidents need. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm afraid that we all, that's all we have time for. Thanks very much for joining me here today um, at the table in the tataonline.net studio here in, uh, in Hilversum. Uh, but thank you also to the viewers out there. Thank you for tuning in for safety promotion. If you enjoyed today's session, today's focus session, be our ambassador and tell your friends about the work of Avia Assist. If you want to support our work, become a friend of Avia Assist. You can do that at our website www.aviassist.org forward slash shop. And uh, we've adapted so you can pay in many ways, including mobile money, which is very popular in Africa. And I can assure you, support will go a long way because all the experts we deploy, like the people here at the table today, are volunteers. We'd also love to welcome you to our first AVSC Safety Promotion Center, the ASPC Rwanda. Come and work towards your certificate in one of our unique courses at the University of Rwanda. And please don't forget, only you can target safety. Join us for the next focus session as we continue our mission with you to improve African aviation safety. For now, Murawejo and have a good day. <laughs>